What? You're getting a lot of marker advance. Yeah, I know. Why? Maybe it just needed to wake up. Yeah, probably. I'm gonna go with that. These things were never meant to be shut off. If we take a walk, uh, if we take a walk through the number five, we kind of get an idea for what's going on inside of it. At least a little bit. I'll take you down this aisle here. That's cool. So what we're looking at here, this is the uh, the incoming register. We have, I think, eight of them. I think eight. And what this is doing is it's registering the digits the customer dials. You can hear it. Mm -hmm. So that's all this does. Registers the digits, passes them on to the next thing. Registers the digits, passes them on. That's all this thing is doing all day long. Here we go again. Now these little yeah. readouts right here tell you what digits being stored in this tank. It should light up eventually. It did a minute ago. It was yeah. lit The other really nice thing about these relays is because they were so reliable, they actually didn't need to design in any space to work on them. So they could have more relays in the same area by packing them really closely together, and that was another thing that made this system possible. In the panel, this would have been a whole aisle of cabinets, but now it's just this one. Wow. I'll take you down here and show you the marker. It's kind of the uh sorry about the squeeze. So in this system. The marker is the part that actually makes the decisions route and connect the call. Um, remember I said before that you can kind of think of every single cross point in this entire machine as being addressable. Mm -hmm. So this examines the, the digits it gets from the register, says, okay, what do I have to do to connect this? And then examines all the possible cross points and then chooses the one that's the best fit for that connection. It also takes care of the billing, you know, it starts the building counter and does a bunch of other accessory things too. In addition to all that, it's self-checking. <laughs> so if it if it notices a false ground or a false positive on a lead, it'll check itself and then sound an alarm. And those bells you were hearing earlier, that's what that was. This was failing a self-check. And then it drops off and then retries again. And then if it fails again, it just gives up. So we have two markers. This is one of them, and then the one right behind you you're going to hear is the second one. This one's older. Mm -hmm. This one's newer, but they're both the same same circuit. And it will choose either one. It'll kind of, it'll load balance the two. Yeah. All this was Mercer Island. All this, yep. And again, this is only part of it. This would have taken up the whole room as well. Must have been a horrible job getting this stuff here and making it 
Oh yeah. Work one here. of our one of our volunteers actually you might see him over there is is Les. He's 93, and he was a Western Electric installer. So he put these machines in. He started working for Western in 1938, 39, just before the war. Uh -huh. War started. He enlisted in the Marines. He was on the Pacific Theater for the whole war. He came back in 45 and went back to work for Western. And he worked for Western Electric doing this, installing, until 1984, January 1st. So he was a lifelong person, and, and you could you could ask him, and he'll say, yeah, I was there, I was installing that one, I remember putting it in. So we're really lucky to have him. Yes, you are. Boy. Yes. It must be an interesting culture, you guys, who preserve this. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the, whole, the whole bell system, the whole telephone system was, was huge. It was bigger than Google, bigger than Apple, oh, yeah. bigger than Microsoft. I mean, it was, a, yeah. you know, this unthinkably large monopoly that I don't think we have, really have a concept of it today. And the thing that impresses, one of the things that impresses me is the problems that they had, they, they invented problems that nobody else had because they were the first company to be doing something like this. Uh -huh, yeah. So, for instance, they had to do things like figure out what type of wood was the best wood for telephone poles. Yeah. You know, or what type of plastics to use on this particular apparatus that could withstand you know, 20 years of varying stresses in this way. And that's just the material science stuff. But then they also figured out, you know, patterns, methodologies to fix things and patterns to work. And they even, like the color, the, the colors they painted the offices, uh, the specific types of metal alloys to use in relays. So, and, and I don't know, those problems just never existed before they thought of them and then had to find solutions for them, right? A lot of the foundational computer science stuff. Right. Yeah. So the, the, the relay logic circuits that we're using in these machines are the same logic circuits that then evolved into modern comp side. You know, adders, counters, discriminators, all that kind of stuff later became used in every computer in the world. I'd love to bring some kids by that are working on a communication and, and network service and be like, really, did you think about these things? <laughs> yeah, you had to build it out of, of metal alloy. <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't lived until you've had to bulb debug your telephone switch with, <laughs> you know, with lamps. Yeah. Um, so that's what these frames are here, actually. This is, uh, on our side of the aisle, this is the number five crossbar. On that side of the aisle, that's a number one crossbar. That's a different machine, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But what we're standing in front of right now is the MCC, or Maintenance Test Center. And this is where the central office staff could come and get kind of a readout on the status of the switch and debug it if it had problems. Mm -hmm. So this panel, for instance, is telling us what parts of the switch are currently in use. And you can see when the calls get made. These lights will go on and off. It looks like a, a Star Trek set. It is. Yeah. It's. They you know, weren't starting from scratch. No, no, but, but I mean, sense. that was the most complicated thing in anybody's mind. Oh, yeah. So then it'll pick up again, now it's dialing in. So this would give you a readout kind of what was going on in the office. I am pointing to Oh, thanks. Somebody will move through the Okay. Perfect. I appreciate it. And I picked you the hot iron. But well, the nice thing about this machine, that was this was really the first machine to do this, was it had this card punch. So if there was trouble, this would punch a card and drop, oh. drop a card down. That is a beautiful thing. Yeah. Right? That's, That's your logging system right there. Yes. <laughs> so the switchmen, the maintenance people, could actually go home at night for the first time in the history of the bell system because this thing could run all night and it had enough, um, what's the word, redundancy mm -hmm. that, okay, something didn't work, we can drop a card, lock that out, and then when they come in in the morning, 
you can then look at the little holes in your card and go and trace the circuit back and figure out what went wrong. This was a That's phenomenal. And modularly replaced the bed. Yes. So it was very much modular, which the panel system was not. Yeah. The panel system was built and wired in yep. custom in the office that it was being served. That it was served. And this handles both, here's the component and the personal, like, I have cleared this out yes. initial right here, so it was the personnel system yeah. and the computer system. Absolutely, and then you, you once you finished, you logged your cards in the tray, and that would go over to the supervisor's office who would then sort them and say, okay, this is the trouble we'd have, and then reports would be generated to say which parts are having the most trouble. And then those reports would be sent off to corporate HQ, and then corporate would look at all the reports and make bar graphs of what's having the most trouble and what do we have to redesign in the future. This batch of relays we're getting from Poughkeepsie is over. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, even the quality control systems were, were amazing. But the, uh, I like this, I just found this. This was one of our other switchmen, Bob. This is a trouble card. And if you look on the bottom center there, you can see the time it took to find the trouble. Ten years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great. So, now naturally they find it. Yeah. <laughs> Ten years. Oh, they had to explain more on the back. Right? Yeah. So that turned out to be a manufacturing defect. So the programmers did it wrong, essentially, is what that is. So this is really your bug tracking system. Yep. I'm... I think that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and then this all worked on a... This entire apparatus thing you're looking at here worked on a common bus. So that was also one of the first times there was ever like a common communication bus where this frame can cut into any of the frames that are behind it in the back. So you didn't need to have individual test panels for everything. You could just say, okay, cut in to this, test that, show me what you show me the result. On the older systems, like the number one crossbar, there were individual test frames for every piece of apparatus. Integrated test harness. Can you read these acronyms here? On this one, I am not that good because I know I don't know a lot about the number five crossbar, but I can read the acronyms over there. I was going to say I'm sure this mean this doesn't mean what I think. No, it, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can read any of them here, but there is. Uh, I'll read the ones over there. But there is a button or a key on the other side over there. One of them says O, oh, and one of them says No. So it's like the oh no. <laughs> like I know it actually means something, but I just like that it's oh no. Somebody appreciated that when they put it in. Right. It's not that great. Can we put the O next in the home? That'd be good. <laughs> they probably didn't even ask. They just said no. <laughs> so then if once once you had your your trouble card though, you had to then take out the manuals. <laughs> and this is just for the marker circuit. This isn't even for the whole thing. This is just for that one one of the circuits I was showing you. And then find the page that corresponds to the part that you believe the trouble's in, then trace it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course there were the large paper fold-out ones too, like the ones I showed. They would put you to school for this stuff. Yeah. yeah. And they had to have a whole printing house just to keep up with it. Oh, absolutely. The they, did, they did all their own printing. Um, and at, in New Jersey, at Western HQ, they had uh, a master copy of every document for every central office in a giant library. So when yeah. a document was ripped or torn or you needed a, a revised one, you could call them up with a document number and they would run off a new one and mail it to you. Because there were master copies. Murray Hill. Number, that's the number five crossbar. This here is the number one crossbar. So, still a crossbar, it uses that same architecture with the X and Y cross points, but this one's older. This was installed here in Seattle in the U District in 1942. And this office, and ones like it, were actually the direct replacement for the panel system. 
So by 19, you know, by the mid 1930s, the panel system was sort of aging out, and they had come up with better ways to do things. Mm -hmm. So this was the office that came directly after that, and that one came after this one. So with this, there's a lot of similarities in an architectural sense to the panel office. So like I understand this because I understand the panel. Mm -hmm. But there's just a lot of updates that make it a lot nicer. Um, speaking of bulk debugging, if the system had trouble, you'd have automatic lamp panels that would light for you. That would tell you where the trouble was. And then you could fix it from there. Um, also, because this was a master test center area, you could then run. I was trying to break this test before. I wonder. If... So now this could run automatic tests on the machinery behind it. Sounds like it started a vacuum cleaner, too. Yeah, yeah that's the other thing it does. It cleans the floor. <laughs> I think the vacuum's that way. <laughs> How's your housekeeping? <laughs> one of the main advantages of the number one crossbar was something called multi-frequency signaling, which was added to this machine in the 1950s. Many of you guys have like a little bit of a history of telepathy, you'll understand you might, you might have heard this before. So, at the, uh, let's take a step back. At the panel system, I mentioned language, what language it speaks. It's really what signaling type it speaks. Because if you're calling from there to here, that machine has to have a way of telling this machine what you dialed and what to do. And that's the signaling type. So the panel system had a, a very, very old, very unique type of signaling, but in the 1950s, this one here was retrofitted with something a lot more modern called the multi-frequency signaling system. So I'll dial a call, and I'll let you hear a little bit of what that sounded like, and it might be familiar. Now that's not the same as the touch tones on your phone. Mm -hmm. What this is doing is... Thank you. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure yet. What this is doing is the originating side of the equipment is picking up a trunk to the terminating side. And then the originating side will outpulse those digits to the terminating side, which is listening for them, and the terminating side goes, ah, okay, I'll connect you there. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot faster. And because it was AC, by virtue of being a sound wave, it could propagate a lot better over long distances. And because it was AC, you could send that over carrier circuits or microwave circuits mm -hmm. instead of just copper wires. The older type of signaling was DC. It could either be on mm -hmm. or off. There wasn't any. Hence the name Bod. Yes. Yep. So, this was a huge advancement, but it was also a huge problem when the very early hackers figured out how to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, how to whistle. Yes, how to whistle, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Blue boxes. Yeah, blue box. Exactly. That's exactly what this is. <laughs> so. They were, they were so proud when they came up with this because like you know, they published ads, and they went, wrote, they released all their technical papers on it. There's a blue box right there. <laughs> it's a blue box. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Hilarious. They couldn't other test equipment blue. It was named after what the amateurs painted theirs as well. <laughs> That's, that's an official telephone company authorized. Yeah, it's a KS22475 blue box. Ah, of course. <laughs> we, we joke because everything has a designation number down, course, to, the, yeah. down to the screw. Yeah. Yeah, so you're like, oh yeah, obviously a KS2321 um, red thing. You know? 
but yes. I've never seen a real blue box before. Thank <laughs> Isn't you that for cool? That. <laughs> This thing is cranky too. It's okay. <laughs> hey Astrid, yeah. can you de busy the stuck sender? Below it. Thanks. <laughs> what happens is if the sender gets an input it can't handle, it'll stick, it'll lock out. Just like any other thing that has like a you know a break point in it or some way to go, I, I can't handle this. Mm -hmm. It lights a lamp right there and then the technician would see the lamp lit and then address the problem, and once the problem is addressed, you can unbusy it. Is that where the... Sorry, go ahead. It's better for it to go out of service and just stay stuck so it can be fixed than, than, than to misdirect oh. a bunch of calls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You can also, if you want, clear the... restore the sender test frame. It's the second one from the right. Start key is on the left. Why did you everything? Nice. Yeah. Nice. Everything is different. It's... Yeah. No convention. <laughs> One of the things, because I remember you asked about reading the abbreviations on the panels, was learning to understand the very specific, industry-specific language they used. Because I noticed when I started here that I couldn't understand any of the words they were using. And it wasn't that I couldn't understand the circuits, it was that like, what What does that even mean? You know? Why would you call that then? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so... And the abbreviations are really bonkers. Yeah. 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 The initials don't make sense for the words. So you had to learn all these abbreviations like CA, which is different than CAP, and ST, which doesn't always mean start. Um, <laughs> NO, which means... No! Yeah. No, normally, no. Normally open sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> ON, which doesn't mean on, it means off normal. Which means doing something more busy or... Yeah, so, so this... You know, it really had to learn by immersion. It's yeah. almost like going to a foreign country where they speak yeah. a different language and you don't understand what everyone's talking about until you just yeah. just <laughs> dive in and go, okay, I'm going to have to figure this out eventually. <laughs> it's kind of a gnome-like existence, isn't it? And yeah. It's all artificially lit, yeah. you know, racks and racks of... Yeah. And with strange people... Yeah. Who speak a weird language? Yeah. And they we can't hear other people. Yes. They would all have hearing damage. Yes. One hundred percent. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, yeah. How could they not? The, the din would just be. This, oh, well, this is incredibly quiet. Yeah. 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 If this was uh, Mother's Day, it was the busiest day of the year, and on Mother's Day you would have to shout. Like I would have to shout just to be just for you to hear me. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, you feel some of the equipment going, but imagine like this entire floor and bigger, completely full of yeah. stuff that's just All banging. Yeah, yeah, all banging. Pre-OSHA yeah. requirements for protection. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, there were bell system stilts, also pre-OSHA. <laughs> they did this thing at one point where they were like, we think stilts might be more efficient than ladders, so use these stilts to get up to high things. And I'm like, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> what? Who? Who was like, that's a good idea, we yeah, should do that. really narrow, you can't yeah. fall very far. <laughs> so the things they did before OSHA, speaking of things they did before OSHA, this is a part of the power board. So you would have, that's the battery bay right there. Wow. So that was a long time ago. Yeah. But the, the, the central office still runs on batteries similar similar to that. Because you get AC, you get three phase AC in from the, you know, from the whoever. And then you had converters, which would convert that to, you know, high amperage DC that would then run through the batteries to smooth it out. And then it would come out and you'd have here we have two 24 volt converters. Around the corner there are 130 volt DC converters. 
And then this thing also, the main bus out is 48 volts DC. So all your power would come through here. And they still use 48 volts yep. DC. Yep. To this day. Yep. That's like, oh yeah, well he has fiber. Yeah. It no was negative 48 volts DC to prevent corrosion, but 48 volts. We're running a little bit high right now. We're running at about 52. It's 48 volts nominal. We're just running a little bit hot. And what's the klaxon for? That was some kind of alarm. We just have it hooked up to bell or to buttons. <laughs> Now everybody thinks it's lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a ginormous DC generator? Yep, that's exactly what that is. This thing is kind of neat too. I'll just show you this real quick. Big loud machine. Any coffee I can spill? <laughs> okay. So you had the entire office was always running on batteries. Uh, but during times of high load or other situations, your battery voltage could dip. Mm -hmm. But because of how the batteries work chemically, you didn't want that to happen because if your voltage went too low, I've never seen this, but I was told by someone who worked in this area that your polarity could actually flip. And then you'd have some batteries that were opposing polarity yeah. of your other batteries. You don't want that. And then you could flip them back, but then that ruined the battery, and then you just all kinds of horrible, horrible stuff. So you never want it to go under voltage. So what this does is this is a big switch, and you have your main battery group, your emergency group one, and then if you're really screwed, your emergency group one and two. <laughs> so in a, in a crisis... <laughs> bring in your emergency groups to keep the voltage level of the office up. Now when crisis was averted, that is a big starter. Yeah. And it's even you can even hand crank it. But I don't advise it. <laughs> well it if the motor went hot while the crank went, I mean, oh, yeah, you, your arms you could hurt yourself. It says open before cranking, just to tell you that. Right. There's a manual option. Yeah. 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 If it's completely screwed. Yeah. <laughs> I would not want that motor to start while I, while I was cranking. That would be important. Yeah. The nice thing about this is once you spend enough time working in a central office or in this museum, you get a sense for what all the sounds mean. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have this sixth sense of when something is, is it right, right? And I've, we've, all, we've all had it, all of us who spend a lot of time here, we hear something in the distance that's like, oh, that doesn't sound quite right, and we'll go over and figure it out. And that's something that like Les and Bob talked about, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, it almost becomes a living machine, and you're like, yeah, yeah, it's got the hiccups again. <laughs> I, I like to think of these things as, as sort of living. You know, that's how I imagine them as being alive. And I know, um, oh. I know Bob does too. Bob's another switchman who's worked for the Dell mm -hmm. system since you know the '50s. Yeah, Bob said he was once on the phone with someone who was uh, in a number five. Crossbar across town, like he was actually standing right there at one of those machines, and and the machine dropped a card, uh, uh, an error report, and Bob said, "Hey, have you been getting a lot of jams on your uh, on your card punch?" And the guy was like, "Yeah, how'd you know?" And he's like, "Well, it sounds like it's running a little fast." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. That's Bob. <laughs> Just in the middle of a conversation. Yeah. yeah. Bob was always the one who said. He, he told me this. He's like. They could always find me because they just say, go to the part of the machine where it's talking. Yeah. And then Bob would be sitting there talking to it. <laughs> what do you want? Tell me. No, not that one. You know, like, you just talk to it. You know? Wow. Yeah. And that's, I, I actually, I, I find that helpful to me when I'm working on it. People know where I am because I'm talking to it. <laughs> yeah, this is a big DC generator. There would have been a number of these in the basement. That's where the power, that's where this power board would have been also. 
on the first floor. Are you having your gym head exposed? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, you guys should check out the Steed Museum. Oh, yeah. Where's the Steed Museum? <laughs> Just down the road, not very far. But they're not open today. They're not open today. They're only open the second Saturday of every month in the morning from like 10. Because they're very small staff. They're even smaller than you. Yeah. It's a big place. It's a big place. It's yeah. just <laughs> <laughs> um, But they have the original steam turbines from like 1908. Oh, they're, they're vertically mounted. So you can actually go under and stand underneath the vertically mounted. It's really wild. But you can Google it. It's Georgetown Steam Plant or something similar. And they have a website. Imagine all those uh, brushes sparking. Oh, here's the, uh, here's the oh no scene. Oh, oh no. Oh no. You. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, I just, I think those are my favorite keys. I, um, I make labels for a living. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> And yeah, this is just the guts of the number one, uh, number one crossbar. I'll show you real quick the translation table. That's always good. Oh, yeah. So when it's deciding where to route a call, this is how it does it. It uses cross connect fields. There's also one behind you. Yeah, that's the main one there. So. There's a, for each office code, whether it's 722 or 232 or whatever, there's a, there's a terminal and then how you wire that terminal up through here and there, how you cross connect everything, tells the machine how to connect that call. So if you want to make a change to how it routes calls, you come over here and you literally just unsolder a couple wires and you solder them in different places. Like programming with a plug board. It's just what it is. Like the old office telephone system where you had to go in and, and manually inspect every line. Yeah. 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 There were, uh, if we go back behind this aisle, I will, I will show you something. Ah, yes, okay. It's cool. It's hot. Yeah, I know. No, no. See this? Yeah. And the one over right here? Mm -hmm. Yep. Can you imagine wiring all these? <laughs> Can you imagine fixing it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> so when they moved this here, they cut all the wires, see? Oh. So in order to get it working again, they had to reconnect a number of them. But it's better to have it with a couple of cut wires than not have it at all. So. Yeah. That's the kind of wire that uh, Grace Hopper mm -hmm. used to give out little pieces of yeah. as nanoseconds. Oh yeah, her nanoseconds. Yeah. I saw that. I saw that there's one of her talks on YouTube. I used to have one. She yeah. gave it to me. Yeah. Nanosecond? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My one nanosecond. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, it, all that wire came out of the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was really cool. Yeah. yeah. She was really neat. Peter, you're looking like you are trying to find something. No, I'm just seeing if there were any more cats. Under the elevator, so. Okay. I'm getting hungry and this is bad. Well, <laughs> that's because you rang the bell. <laughs> Alright. Am I paying this time? No. I'll order it, yeah. <laughs> Division of labor. <laughs> my body does not forgive me. It's like, you're hungry now. <laughs> this is the ringing machine. This is what actually generated the voltage to ring your bells and your telephone, and it also generated the ringback tone that the caller would hear 